Hey, weirdos! I'm Elena. And I'm Ash. And this is Morbid. I had just like stretched one of those good, strong, deep stretches when nice. I said that. That's why it came out a little crackly. That's okay. I was yawning while you said, hey, we're so <laughs> it all worked out. It's we're early. Wreck. It's early. It's wedding week. I'm tired. It's just all of that. We're working. We're, we're twerking. Working. We I'm are. really trying to learn how to twerk. I was just going to say, we are not twerking. You could twerk if you um, wanted to. You can twerk if you want to. <laughs> you can, leave you can give it a behind. try. <laughs> No, Ash is on a quest. I am. And I'm not going to interfere in that quest. I'm just going to be on the sideline and I'm going to cheer her on. Thank you. Moral the TikTok support. girlies say that you just lean forward and shift the weight between your heels, <laughs> but I look like a duck when I do that. So, But I was doing it the other day in my mirror and I think I'm getting somewhere. Oh, I think I, I can't show you quite yet. I'm really perfecting okay. the strategy, but I think I figured something out. Good. I mean, I, I shall wait with bated breath. I'm glad. That's me on my twerk journey. Thanks for hearing me out. <laughs> Brought to you by twerk journey. Ass. <laughs> We're silly goofy today. We are. You know, it's it's a crazy week because Ash is going to be a, you know, a married wife. lady at the end of it. Whoa. So that's fun. That's cuckoo nuts bananas. Elena's and then we the just head go bitch back in charge. To, yeah. And then we just go back to regular life. Well, for like a minute, but then I leave again. Yeah. But like first Thanksgiving, you know. I wasn't going to leave for that. I fucking love your Thanksgiving. <laughs> and last year I got the neurovirus on Thanksgiving, so yeah. I was I couldn't cook. And then I tried to take over Thanksgiving and nobody wanted me to, so. Because I've, I've really put my stamp on Thanksgiving. No, it's if I can't we, cook it, apparently it can't happen. I mean, pretty much actually was the answer that I was given. Yes. But this year, I the worst part was last year was I had all the stuff ready to go. And yeah. I, I was ready because I always have it like all laid out. I have some things cooked the night before, like at least prepared the night before. Mm -hmm. And I woke up in the morning and started dying. Yeah. And Got full blown neurovirus literally the morning of things. Like woke up mm -hmm. at four a.m. and that was that. Yeah. So nobody. So you know, everybody had store bought Thanksgiving that yeah. That year. Uh, last Thanksgiving was the most depressing Thanksgiving ever because last dad, year was depressing. Though. Last year was so depressing. Yeah. Drew's dad had COVID last year. Oh, so yeah. So we couldn't even go to like his parents yep. for Thanksgiving. So we literally just like sat yeah. at home. And that was like the worst year anyways. Like we had a lot going on. People were making our lives miserable. Not you guys. Trust me. No, never you guys. Um, the people who didn't know who they are. And yeah, uh, we're not going to have that this year. No. Because this year we said, behold my field of fucks for it is barren. I said, Dave's you will Yikes. not ruin it. Dave's Yeggs. Dave's Yeggs. You don't know uh, what that means, but I do. <laughs> but yeah, it was a rough. It was rough. Actually, my youngest this year yeah. literally asked me last night. She said, um, can you promise not to get the tummy bug this <laughs> Thanksgiving? And I was like, you're like, let's not trust talk me. about it. I That was not my intention last year. Mm -mm. I did not ask for that. I did not manifest it. But. You should take. You should start taking airborne. I'm going to. I'm going to do everything. I'm like, because now I'm scared. I like the. I like the. This is not sponsored, but the elderberry. Um, Ooh. Elderberry airborns. First the of all, they berry. taste delicious, and second of all, elderberry. Elderberry is like just one more punch to the one, flu and punch. cold season. All right, well, you heard it here first, okay? Elderberry <laughs> or elderberry. elderberry. If you're from Boston. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Every time I say it, I'm like, someone's going to correct me, but that's just like Elderberry, if you're nasty. <laughs> Respect your elderberries, okay? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh. I'm in such a silly mood, but I have to tell you a pretty rough tale. Awesome. Uh, I do have a two-pata for you. A two-pata, kid. Two-pata. Uh, we're going to be talking about Sharon Kinney today, also known as La Pistolera. Very familiar, that name. Yeah. I actually, like, I'd heard her name before, but I did not know the details of this case. I think that's where I am. I've heard the name. I don't know anything about what you're about to tell me. Well, I kind of love that because this is a wild tale from start to finish. Um, part one is pretty, like, fast-paced, like, we're going to get through a lot. And then I will tell you part two is a little bit trial-heavy in the beginning. Okay. But I have to make it that way. Just, like, it makes sense for the setup. But yeah. once we get through the trial stuff in part two... Shit goes down. Okay. Like, 
So just know that, like, bear with me through that in part two. Yeah. And I know some of you like, like, really like going through the trial part. Too. Yeah. So, you know, you'll love that. It's some people's cup of tea. It's other people's not cup yeah. of tea. Personally, it's actually not my favorite tea. But it's the trial part. Yeah. It's like, I would drink it, but you I wouldn't would drink it. It wouldn't be my first choice. Yeah, I feel you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, let's let's get into it. We're going to talk about Sharon Kinney. Let's go. But before she was Sharon Kinney, she was born Sharon Elizabeth Hall on November 30th, 1939 in Independence, Missouri. 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 Her father was Eugene and her mother was Doris Hall. Eugene was a steel worker and Doris was a homemaker. And when she was young, her father actually, Sharon's father, hurt himself on the job and became unemployed due to that injury that he got. So once he was out of work, he started drinking heavily, and he really paid no attention to his kids. So dark from the start. I was going to say, so we're killing it already. Yeah, and we're not really going uphill at all because Sharon's mother, Doris, was equally distant, especially when it came to her daughter. And as a result, Sharon started to develop a very creative imagination, I think, out of loneliness. Mm, That makes sense. You know? And a former school friend told reporters she'd take us on explorations down through a sewer on the way home from school. (laughs) She'd talk about finding money and jewels that were hidden there. We didn't even see the filth or know it was there until we got home and our mother started howling. So she was like, just join me in the sewers. But I kind of love that. She was such an adventurous, like, let's go find hidden jewels. Yeah. I love that. That That was me as a kid. That was a cool thing about I was always beginning. making that shit up. Oh, no. Yeah. You oh, can I like did. that about child That's sharing. the thing. I don't know anything about this case, so I didn't know if Sharon was... Yeah. I don't know what's going on. She's the perp. But either way, that's that was me as a kid. I used well, to want to do weird shit like that. And you feel bad for kid Sharon. Like, her parents yeah. were basically just like, fuck off. Yeah, you know? it's true. Now, by the time she reached high school, Sharon's creativity had taken a, a more serious, guarded tone. Oh, okay. Another former friend said, I think Sharon was always strange and alone. Oh, and as a teenager, I know it is as a teenager, her complexion was described as, quote, uh, modeled and sallow, sometimes pimply, which made her the target of a lot of bullying and shitty comments from people. Oh, that sucks. And then when she was 14, the family actually moved briefly to Washington due to rumors that Sharon had secretly married an unnamed man who, quote, died when his truck plunged over a cliff in Idaho. What? (laughs) The wild thing is there's not evidence to indicate whether these rumors are true or not. But when Sharon did eventually marry her question mark first or second husband, James Kinney, she did list herself as a widow on the marriage license. What? Yeah. Uh, That's just like so bizarre. Just came out of nowhere. And then when you learn about a secret man who plunged over a cliff in a truck, like what? Well, when you learn about like what Sharon is all about, huh? Maybe that did happen. I don't know. Damn wild that is wild widowed or not the halls ended up moving back to independence uh, about a year later when sharon was 15 and she resumed her increasingly solitary life Hmm. in the summer of 1956 she met 22 year old james kinney at a mormon church function and even though she was six years younger than his 22 year old self oh do the math on that yeah james was instantly attracted to the 16 year old yeah Uh, Unlike Sharon, who was smart, savvy, and emotionally mature, James was shy, he was deeply self-conscious, and he was a student who was uh, home on break from Brigham Young University. It makes sense that he was, you know, emotionally immature and, like, not, you know, because, I mean, she's 16. Exactly. 22. Like, what are you going to What do you have to connect on if you're not (laughs) emotionally immature? Now, Sharon noticed James was staring at her all night, but he didn't make any move to come over and talk to her. So she actually took the initiative Mm. and approached him, instinctively sensing that his attraction to her kind of gave her the upper hand in the situation. Uh, Yeah. Now, to James, a shy Mormon boy on campus surrounded by, you know, chaste proper Mormon girls, Sharon's boldness was very exciting. And also, her unfamiliar, sarcastic, biting wit kept him off balance the entire time they talked, which was even more exciting to him. In my opinion, also still wrong because, you know, she's 16 years old and he's 22. Yeah, it's not. It's, this is not a, a cute moment. No, it's not. But Sharon knew that she had the upper hand, like I said. So she made it seem like she wasn't super interested, but she did end up giving James her phone number before abruptly walking away. Wow. Now, in all reality, James 
or someone like him, offered a potential escape from this small town life that she'd been dreaming of since her family came back to Missouri the year yeah. before. She wanted Sounds out like of she's, here. She's bored. She's lonely. She's yeah. neglected. So Exactly. Yeah. Author James C. Hayes wrote, Sharon maintained ambitious dreams. She wanted to find a prince who'd speared her off to anywhere that wasn't Independence, Missouri. She wanted to be a woman of glamour and wealth. Now, James Kinney may have not may not have been a prince exactly, but Sharon saw that she could use his, for lack of a better term, naivete mm. to her advantage. And while she figured she might have been able to do better than him, she definitely could have done worse. Wow. <laughs> What a, what a dream. Ambition. Yeah. <laughs> so James did not wait long to call Sharon. And despite the considerable age difference, they did start dating very quickly. And quickly they became inseparable. I'm uncomfortable. Me as well. I also feel like it's it doesn't excuse this behavior, but I feel like this was so much more common in like the 50s. Oh, yeah. You know it what definitely I mean? was. Like, yeah, there's no excuse for it at all. But you're right. Like this was a much more common thing. Yeah. That like, was just kind of like not side-eyed no it really was thing it's and it's so strange to look at now it really is because it's again i always think we're in the year 2000 here so i'm like you know, know like 50 years ago it was and that's a long time but i'm right. like no it was a lot longer than 50 years ago now so like that's a long time ago and yeah. it makes sense now that we're like oh like what the fuck like, what the fuck we're like that about a lot of things yeah but the more infatuated James grew with Sharon, the more people around him became suspicious or uncomfortable with her. There was mm. something off about her. Okay. For example, just after uh, after just a few weeks, James' father, Haggard Kinney, had become so uneasy around Sharon that he actually voiced his concerns to his son. Wow. And he said he was worried about the way she, quote, played James like a marionette. Ooh. He was like, I think she's got the upper hand yeah. here. Yeah. And like... Sure, that could be fine, but she's playing you. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like you want to have some balance here. Yeah, nobody that's the should thing. be the all powerful being in your relationship. Right. And James, he loved and respected his father immensely. Like they talked about a lot, they were close, yeah. but he did not agree. Ooh. He simply could not see what others saw in Sharon and dismissed their concerns without even a second thought. Oh, I've seen so many people like this. Love blind. So when the summer came to an end and James headed back to college in Utah, Sharon got really, really anxious about the fact that she might be losing her ticket out of independence. Jeez. She might not have been in love with James. I personally don't really think she was. And I don't really think he was in love with her at that point. I think they were maybe getting there. Yeah. But she did know that he was her best chance to get out of small town life. It's and codependence. She, it's codependence, mm -hmm. exactly. And she was very, very worried that with him heading back to school, some other girl might take that away from her. Oof. So playing into his religious sense of moral responsibility, Sharon sent him a letter at school in September saying, quote, the sins of summer have produced a child in my womb. Shut the fuck up. But don't worry. I don't expect you to sacrifice your education and return to independence. I'll handle the situation. That is so dark and to do. And so manipulative. That's unbelievably manipulative. And just like the way she phrased it. As, the sins of summer. The sins of summer have produced a child in my womb. I gotta go. Uh -huh. I gotta go. Uh, the sins of summer had not produced no, a child. No, of course in her that, womb. not. One she's part lying. of me believed that. In case anybody else out there was yeah. like, wait, is she pregnant? No, no, she's not. She's not. She's not pregnante. I don't even know this story, and she is not. There's she's nothing not pregnant. about me that thought she was telling the truth. No. No, but wow. she knows what she's doing because That's... he's deeply religious. So her saying, She's essentially She's saying, saying I'll take I will, care of this situation, you know, and get he's rid of deeply this. religious. And obviously that would trigger something in him. Precisely. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And she's like 16. I was at just going to say, isn't she 16? That is high level manipulation. Sharon, <laughs> like, Sharon damn. operates at a higher level. I'm not saying it's a better level, but she operates at a higher level. It's a higher level of, of depravity. It is. Exactly. Wow. That's, that was a beautiful sentence. Thank you. I like, I like when you say depravity. I like depravity. Yeah, it's a, good. Yeah. Now, James, he didn't like depravity, but he no. was a little shocked and not really sure what he should do. Like, yeah, he's. He's a kid. He's not a kid, but for all well, intents and purposes, he kind of is. Well, and it sounds like his, you know, he was emotionally very immature. So it's like, yeah. this, is a, this is a lot. And it's, to me, it sounds like he lived a very sheltered life. But I'm also like, you got, you guys obviously committed some sins over the summer. I mean, yeah. It's like, so you can't have that, you know, you can't be that 
like that connected confused. to those those thoughts that you have those boundaries that you have mm-hmm. like it <laughs> seems like they might be a little fake <laughs> seems like it or it seems like Sharon was like listen we're fucking doing this yeah but it's like but dude, it takes two to yeah, tango, takes two if to you tango. Will. but so he wasn't sure what to do so he showed the letter to a female friend and she was like you know she might be lying to you to trap you <laughs> into was, a relationship. She was me. She was like, nothing about that is real. <laughs> she was like, poetic, but... Yeah, like, wow. But garbage. Garbage. <laughs> and James was like, no, Sharon would not lie to me. She, and I don't think she would lie about this. I don't think she's capable of that. She would. And <laughs> she absolutely <laughs> would. And having, being, having been raised in a strict Mormon family, he just couldn't believe that a woman would lie to him especially about something like pregnancy but it's like you guys fucked before you were married yeah. like you're not super connected to these ideals obviously that's the thing like I, the cherry picking here is really annoying it's just like okay well you can't be that upset about it because you guys fucked mm-hmm. so i don't know it's one <laughs> of those things though where like i know they are super no, it's connected true. It's to all, those like ideals. this seems very cherry picked what you're gonna like be bothered by but it is but it it's very just kind of funny i'm like okay but he came to the conclusion that the only thing he could do was return to independence and make Sharon an honest woman marry her. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Mormons. <laughs> Pick that part. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. So in early October of 1956, James took a leave of absence from Brigham Young University, packed up the few belongings he had, headed back to Missouri, intending upon doing the right thing. On October 17th, James, his father, and Sharon went to the Jackson County Courthouse to apply for a marriage license. Now, having secured her future with James, Sharon's attitude underwent a noticeable change. According to author James Hayes, who wrote the Sharon Kinney story, quote, she no longer shared complicity in the pregnancy, but blamed the child on him alone. She angrily reminded him that his lust interrupted her college and hinted at having been through this before with another man. What? Sharon has been around, baby. And she's just got so, like, I'm just, like, the high, again, the high level of manipulation here is just, like, really right. sinister. Because she is a 16-year-old woman running around like she has seen some shit, been through some shit. And yeah. it kind of sounds like she had been through some That's shit. That's the thing. And it's, like, and I know I'm, like, I was, like, getting on James here for, like, cherry-picking what he was going to follow in his religious and moral beliefs here. Yeah. Which I stand by. That's very cherry picked because, like, you were having sex with an underage girl. So, like, there's your first uh, moral cherry first picking. First whammy. And two, you are uh, fucking before marriage. That's your second moral cherry picking. But, Double like, whammy. I also believe he is clearly being, like, high level manipulated here, which yes. is, like, a wild part. So, there's, like, a lot of things going on here that I'm just like, this is all wrong. Oh, it's wild. All of it. It only gets wilder. Damn. Please no. So she's she's saying like her that she's gone through this before. She's upset with him now that he's back when it seems like that's exactly what she wanted. And as she's filling out her portion of the paperwork, she starts mumbling all these kinds of shitty things about his father, Haggard, who is right there, literally standing right next to her. What? And she's openly berating James for allowing his family's beliefs about virginity and religious purity to rob her of the traditional church wedding that she thought she was entitled to. What? <laughs> but it's like, isn't this what you wanted? <sighs> but now you're upset because this is what she wanted, but it's not she her version. Know what she wants. I think she wanted him to marry her, but I yeah. think she wanted it to be this big fucking bash in a church and like Yeah, she wanted all the She the wanted attention there. But like you, but it's like you're in a fucking pickle right now. Yeah. You're 16. You're pregnant by this Mormon guy. He's going to keep this hush hush. He's not going to give you this big huge wedding that you think you're entitled to. Damn. And we're going to pretend like you got pregnant after this courthouse ceremony. And it's like she's not pregnant. And she's not pregnant. Like, exactly. So this is all just a lie. So it's like you're the lie is keeping you the lie that from you told. most of this. The lie that you made up. What the fuck? She's reaping what she's sown and she doesn't like it. But she thought she was she was sowing exactly this. Damn. It's wild. I'm this is just like so much. There's so many layers of just like wrongness here. Oh, just like, wait. We're about you know those like potatoes that people make where there's just like 60 yeah, the billion layers of t- crispy thin, potatoes. Ooh, yeah. Those That's the good. story. But this not is as like, scrumptious. Yeah. This is an a not delicious this version is, of that. It's like um, they've like ratatouille. 
no, like it, they've gone bad at they've this got, point. What did bad. the cheese do yesterday? It, it's coagulated. Coagulated. Ooh, yes. Yeah. This is the coagulated version. It of is. Those Every layer is just yuckier. Yeah, moldy even. You know, because you know the cheese goes on the potatoes, but it's bad after a while. Yeah, this is just because like the manipulation is wild, but it's by a sixteen-year-old, so it's like the power dynamic here is so weird because it's like she's a younger. Yeah. young lady she's six years younger than him who is much younger than him where mm. they shouldn't even be in a relationship to begin with but not mentally so, like that's the problem there mm -hmm. like the first problem and then it's like but then the manipulation is coming from the person who shouldn't have the power in that scenario like very strange it's a it's a weird i don't know how, i'm very upset by all of this you will continue to i get think it's so all fucked up personally it is but the next day, the marriage license was approved, and the two were married in a small ceremony held in the Kinney home. Oh, okay. Not the big wedding that Sharon had hoped for. No. Now, believing he'd done the right thing, James packed himself and his new wife into the car, and the newly married couple returned to Utah. Of course they did. Where he was like, I'm going to continue my studies, because I have my future. Yeah. Now And now he was more determined than ever to quote unquote, make something of himself and support his new well, family. Well, because now, again, like he's like, he's got this strange set of ideals, so it's like now he's he's being pulled in several different directions and he's probably feeling like, okay, now I really got to finish this because I'm going to be the provider. Father, yeah. yeah. Like of this child that doesn't exist. Exactly. Yeah. Now when they arrived in Provo, James and Sharon moved in with James's friend temporarily while he worked to find a place of their own. But unfortunately any hope that they, that James had of Sharon settling down now that they were married was immediately dashed once they settled in Utah. Shocked. From the moment they arrived, Sharon complained about absolutely everything, from their temporary accommodation, which was pretty cramped, to the fact that he never had time to take her anywhere because he was studying. Just everything. And her constant negativity and cruel comments made it impossible for him to focus on his studies because they were always fighting. Yeah, it's just this is abusive. Exactly. And in late December, after just two months in Utah, they ended up moving back to Independence. Oof. Which is exactly where she wanted to get away from. I know. This and the second she got away from it, she sabotaged that's it. That's the thing. It's like, she, that's what I mean. She doesn't know what she wants. She I don't think she does. She does not. She thinks she knows what she wants. She doesn't. That's the thing. She wants power. She wants control. But it sounds like she wants chaos as well. So it's like, I well, don't... I think she's somebody that thrives uh, yeah, in chaos I without think she does. recognizing it. Yeah. Now, back in Missouri, James and Sharon moved into the, uh, a small house next door to his parents, which his father owned. So, like, allowed them, like, gave them a home to yeah. live in. And Sharon is constantly talking about how much she fucking hates this man. Oh, man. She also hated living next door to the in-laws she looked down on them she constantly mocked them for their conservative ways and their deep held religious beliefs which is like what the fuck is it to you man when it's like also this is the person that you chose to trap that's so. the thing it's like this is the family you married into right. you know what you were getting into and this you is the beliefs they held they weren't hiding them no like that's the thing now while James's father had already realized what kind of person Sharon was, and that's exactly why she didn't like him. I was going to say, that's why she didn't like him. From the jump. Yeah. But his mother refused to believe that any kind of young woman could be so cruel and calculating. Believe it, girl. Mm -hmm. <laughs> According to Hayes, James's mom, quote, believed in storybook relationships and thought that a mother and her son's wife should be close. She sounds like a very sweet woman. I was going to say, I mean, yeah, that sounds delightful. And that is yeah. absolutely like the ideal. Well, and Sharon's mom barely ever made time for her in her childhood. Yeah. And once they came back to Independence, James and Sharon, the mom, Sharon's mom still wasn't involved. But James's mom went out of her way to be kind to Aww. Sharon. She offered to pay their bills when they fell behind. She would take Sharon on shopping trips. She'd take her out to lunch. She sounds like th that's like your ideal mother-in-law are you kidding me like she's acting like a mom like yeah. stepping in being like a mother figure to you and when you're not necessarily the nicest person to her husband or her son i was just gonna say you've been a shit-tastic person to her son <laughs> and her husband like but she's you're trying like, you're mocking their like religious beliefs you're mocking all everything about them and she's still being kind to you i like, mean that's the that's the way that people you know are supposed to be is, exactly like, be nice to people but sharon she was like damn Fuck you. Sharon. Fuck you fuck now not long after they resettled in independence sharon started filling her days spending what little money james Aww. was making at the time which quickly turned out to not be enough to satisfy her spending habits so as a result she set out to find her own job to subsidize her constant need to spend money now even though she was very skilled at nearly every job she tried 
She worked in a print shop. She was a babysitter at one point. She was a legal secretary, a a hotel receptionist, and she was great at all of those things. But every time she started a new job, she just got bored easily. And the second she got bored, she quit. And like spent zero time. At so these she's jobs. just she, she has no staying power for something. Like None. she's not going to stick it out. Even if she's good at it, it's yeah. just mundane. To her. If she's bored, she's it's not going to happen. Exactly. Yeah, even if it's a good thing. Even if it is. And when she was working and making money, she also insisted that the money she made should not be considered family income. Instead, she thought of the money that she made as hers to use as she pleased. And even with her own income, she continued to spend money recklessly usually charge uh, charging things to james's account instead of her own this is dysfunctional it's everybody. the definition of dysfunctional. dysfunctional i mean you do what you want with your bank accounts in your own homes like yeah, that's your, your business life. this is dysfunctional to this me. is not well bitch like, because no, everybody is not happy with this arrangement so because it started out on a lie yeah and You're it's not still, pregnant i mean isn't she still claiming to be pregnant mm-hmm. and we're like that's gonna come when there's no actual pregnancy or child yeah Th- that's no she takes you're gonna care have of to it. fess up no she doesn't no okay no. so what well, actually lord we're there okay guys and just uh quickly trigger warning for like mention of pregnancy loss oh <laughs> one afternoon several months after they settled back in independence i think she realized like i'm not pregnant i'm not going to start showing anytime soon so i gotta no. do something about this she decided she was tired of the pregnancy ruse since it had served its original purpose of getting oh james to marry her so she was like nah, i'm done with this so James came home that evening, and he this is so sad. He found her in a panicked state, and she told him that shortly after he left work that, mor- that morning, her body, quote, began to reject the baby. So she's claiming she's she suffered a, a miscarriage, miscarriage, which is, fuck this bitch. I can't even. Yeah, fuck this bitch. Honestly. So James was confused, and Sharon used the opportunity to gain even more sympathy from him, by making it seem like his high security job at the Bendix Corporation had put too many barriers in place for her to reach him. And that's why she hadn't told him sooner. So she's literally manipulating him by saying that it's basically like your fault that she's you didn't saying know about this. I've had a I'm like I'm suffering a miscarriage since you left for work this morning. And I, I the reason you don't know is because I couldn't reach you. So this is your fault. That's so fucking sinister. If you are able to fake a miscarriage and like carry on that that lie to the the father, quote unquote, quote unquote something is deeply, deeply wrong yeah. with you. Like, like that's fuck you. Is that's what I say <laughs> on another level. <laughs> if you're faking a miscarriage, fuck you. Fuck you. Yeah. Into oblivion. Yeah, that's <laughs> fucked up. So in January 1957, not long after ending the pregnancy scam, if you will, Sharon learned that she was pregnant for realsies this time. And in the fall, she did give birth to the couple's first child, a daughter, which they named, I think it's either Dana or Dana. Dana? It's two N's. I would say Dana. Dana was my first instinct. Okay. Cute name. Now, from the outside, Sharon seemed to be a devoted mother, constantly doting on her daughter, really living up to every responsibility of domestic life. She actually even started going to church with the family. And if for a second, it seemed like she was embracing the Mormon lifestyle. But like her attempts to hold down a job, she quickly got bored with the life of a homemaker and just went back to ex- uh, spending excessively. Yeah, she's got to stick to something, girl. She's something. She sticks to scheming. Well, there you go. She's steady scheming. She's steady scheming. Now, by 1959, she'd given birth to another child, a boy, which they named Troy, and the family moved into a newly purchased home in a subdivision. And the new baby and the new house seemed to occupy Sharon's attention for a little bit, which made her at least temporarily less abusive towards her husband. Oh, nice. That's great. Yeah. But the baby in the house also gave her a reason to spend more money. And in response, James actually took a slightly higher paying second shift at the Bendix Corporation, which left Sharon alone with the children in the evenings and put more emotional distance mm-hmm. between her and James. With James working in the evenings and the children, have, children having gone to bed, Sharon found herself with way more free time than she'd had in years. So she said, I'm going to look up my old high school boyfriend, John oh, Boldies. Now, unlike her life with James, which was filled with constant arguments, emotional distance, you name it, her relationship with John was exciting oh. because it was the forbidden fruit. Because if you it will. was not this one. That's why. Mm-hmm. 
And she reveled in the thrill of infidelity, <sighs> sneaking around behind her husband's back to meet John at cheap motels in the backseat of his car. Girl. And where James had become increasingly immune to her domineering personality and manipulations, John was easy to manipulate and control because this was new. And that made her feel powerful. Now, even though Sharon eventually grew tired of John, too, and only turned to him when she couldn't find another man to entertain her for the night, he was falling for it. Now, by 1960, life Hi. in the Kinney house had deteriorated to a near breaking point. It seemed to James that Sharon was never home, which was mostly fine by him, except that she wasn't really living up to her end of the domestic bargain. Yeah, that he's working and she's not yeah, doing and anything. Remember, this is a time where a man worked during the day and came home to a hot meal and his children were fed and blah, oh, blah, blah. the 50s. Blah. So he could no longer expect a hot meal when he came home. And instead, she was just leaving him out frozen meals. And she, and that was not the only thing that she was absent in. Like, yeah. She was absent from the children. Yeah. They were being neglected on a regular basis. Their basic needs were more often met by babysitters than their own mother. Yeah, it's like, I'm sorry, if you're going out to, like, uh, fuck other men and leaving your children to be neglected, like, that sucks. Exactly. Like, that's not cool. <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing. James was being like, okay, you're not with the children. I'm not getting hot meals. Where the fuck are you? So he, he caught on pretty quickly to the fact that she yeah. was cheating on him. But he had no idea to the extent which he was right. Uh-oh. And as a deeply, deeply religious person, he knew that divorce would have been discouraged by everybody in his community, and he was right. Whenever he brought the subject up to his parents, his mom would typically encourage him to work out their problems for the children's sake. That's never the way to go, man. No. It's it, never better. <laughs> I understand that, like, that was just the way it was back well, then. Well, I know it's like a religious thing. It still is now yeah, a religious thing. True. That, like, you don't get divorced. You just suck it up and have a horrible marriage for your children. Well, and, and it's people like, no. always say, like, for the sake of the children, the, sake the, of the children, children are not going to thrive in an abusive no, household. No, they see everything. Kids know when you're arguing and when you're not. Yeah, like loving each other and not having a respectful discourse. And if anything, it's say, better yeah. to look at them and say, sometimes these things don't work out. Yeah. And my father, your father apart. and I respect each other enough to not continue. Yeah, with just this. never for the sake of the children never really works out. In yeah. And for, for not, not that I've seen. At well, least. and it didn't here. Yeah. It, I, it didn't at all. Oof. Now, as the weeks went on, staying with Sharon seemed more and more impossible to James. And finally, in mid-March, he actually did bring up divorce to Sharon. And she agreed that their marriage had reached it, uh, its end. But her her terms for a divorce I were knew this was gonna come. outrageous yeah. and unacceptable. She would have bankrupted. Yeah, there was, I was going to say, there was no way she was just going to be like, let's amicably divorce. No, and honestly... Her idea of, like, the terms of this divorce are so disturbing to me, at least. According to Hayes, she was willing to go along with the divorce, but only if James gave her the house, Dana, and $1,000 in cash. Fuck only, Troy, am I, I was right? just going to say, only one of your kids? Like, she wants I would like this one. She wants her daughter. She, James can have the boy. Oh, I hate How this. How fucked up I hate is this that? a lot. Yeah, and that's it's really also fucked like, up. Oh, yeah, you love Dana so much, you're leaving her in babysitter's yeah, you're care neglecting all the time, her. too. And James was like, uh, splitting the children up is out of the question. They're siblings. Like, you're just going to split them? That's so crazy. Like, this isn't the parent trap, yeah. my friend. And so he was like, no, that's out of the question. And with the idea of divorce seemingly being moved away from, his parents were relieved. In fact, after giving it some thought, Sharon herself even decided that she didn't love yeah, the idea of, of divorce because she, she wasn't going to win. Oh, guys, come on. <laughs> it would everybody her. involved here except for James. I'm like, get out of here. <laughs> this poor man. Ugh. Honestly, this poor man. Yeah, at this point, it's like, geez, like he's he's giving it his best shot here. He is, absolutely. And the thing was, so Sharon at this, they talk about the divorce for a little bit, but then she's realizing he's not going to agree to her terms. Her and then she realizes terms. that her terms aren't even really good enough for her. Mm -hmm. It would get her out of marriage, but $1,000 was not enough to live on for very long. And it definitely would not sustain her lifestyle. And the salary that she was working for temporary jobs really gave her little pay. Yeah. So it wasn't going to be a win for her. But there was another way that Sharon could get out of the marriage, and it almost guaranteed that she would get everything she wanted and more. Oh, no. On Saturday afternoon, March 19th, 1960, the Jackson County Sheriff's Department received a frantic call from Sharon Kinney saying that her husband had a heart attack and she needed help right away. Now, when sheriff's deputies arrived at the Kinney home, however, they found a very strange scene. James Kinney was lying on the couple's bed. 
his target pillow, excuse me, his target pistol on a pillow next to him, pointing toward the large hole in the back of his head. At the time, I feel like that's not a heart attack. No, it's very unclear why she says heart attack. Yeah. I don't know if she thought they were going to come faster. Yeah. I think they would still come pretty fast if you said said he was shot. Yeah. I don't know. Strange. I don't know if maybe she didn't want something recorded on the 911 yeah, call. Yeah, maybe not. I don't know. But at the time that they they got there, he was still alive. Ooh. But unfortunately, he would die a short time later on the way to the hospital. Damn. So it was not instant, which is really awful. Ugh. Now, this is so fucked. Sharon told the officers that he'd gone into the bedroom a short time earlier to take a nap. And then a short time later, while she was in the bathroom getting ready to go to church oh, like a course. good woman, yeah. she heard their two-year-old daughter, Dana, ask loudly, how does this thing work, daddy? How does it work? And then she said she heard the shot ring out. I'm sorry. She's blaming this on her two-year-old daughter? She is blaming this on her two-year-old daughter. And not only that, she's going to get away with it. Shut the fuck up. She's going to get away with blaming it on her two-year-old daughter. For a little while, at least. Uh, I'm without words. Without words. Now, James had always had a fascination with guns, and he would take them apart to clean them. But Sharon said that he was also forgetful and careless with them. According to her, he would sometimes leave them lying around the house. Oh, that's fucked up. It is. On the kitchen table next to the television where the children could easily reach them. And the officers did note that his gun belt and ammunition were lying next to the bed, which did seem to support Sharon's claim. But then that her statement was also confirmed by James's parents. He was wow. ir- an irresponsible well, gun owner. Well, that's fucked up. And that's just the truth of yeah. it. Yeah. But still, the death did seem suspicious. Yeah. Accidental shootings did happen, but not typically with a two-year-old. Yeah. And investigators wondered why James would have laid laid down to take a nap with a loaded pistol lying next to his head. Yeah, Like, you can be an irresponsible gun owner, but I don't think it goes to that extent. That's pretty far. Now, and you can't be. Like, I'm saying there are irresponsible gun owners. Now, unfortunately, there wasn't much evidence to prove or disprove Sharon's claims. Yeah. The 22 caliber pistol was taken from the scene, but it was covered in so much gun oil that it was impossible to get any fingerprints off of it, which is interesting. Then the lab technician also didn't bother to test either Sharon or Dana's hands for gunshot residue. What the fuck? No idea why. Or excuse me, I do know why. They believed at that time, this particular lab technician believed that those tests were unreliable. Why wouldn't you just do it anyway? Couldn't tell you. I feel like it's better just to do it. And also, how is that unreliable? You either have gunshot residue on your hands or you don't. And it's like, it's better to do it and then argue about it later than to not do it and be like, well, I guess we'll never know. Well, and if if you do test their hands and Sharon has it on her hands, boom, there you go. Yeah. What? Wow. But the only other test that they did was to determine the pull necessary to fire the gun, which was smart. Now, knowing that the pistol required a 3.25 pound pull, they returned to the Kinney house with a similar disabled pistol to find out whether Dana actually had the strength to pull the trigger. And they did find out that she did. She was able to. In fact, not only did she possess the strength to pull the trigger, but she also knew how to release the safety catch on the gun. Why the fuck did she know that? A two-year-old. Why did this two-year-old girl know how to release a safety on a pistol? I do not know. I'm just trying to think of my kids at two, and I'm like, what is going on here? Yeah, like, this is wild. Y- you would think of a two year old, like, and you don't want to think of a two year old gun, two year old with a gun, but when you do, you would think that they'd be like waving it around. Like, that's the thing. Like, you just, I don't, this is just so strange. It this is. This is very strange. It really wow. is. And I don't know if it's a, a thing where Sharon taught her how to do it so that she could shoot her father. Oh, my God. Or if maybe yeah, she just like, saw her dad shoot the pistol all the time. Maybe. And, like, that's why. Yeah. I, don't I honestly know. have no idea. I don't believe that Dana shot her father. Seems highly unlikely to me. I believe that Sharon did. Yeah. Or that if Dana somehow did shoot her father, it was because Sharon she made it happen. To do that. You know, she was wow. set up. But in their statement to the press, Sergeant Herman Davis of the Kansas City Police told reporters... The bullet, quote, the bullet had entered from the rear and lodged just under the skin between the nose and the right eye. Now, Davis continued that this was consistent with the position of the gun, which was, quote, lying flat on the pillow when it discharged, leaving a crease where it cut the cloth and powder burns were on the pillowcase. 
So the press were also made aware of the working theory that two-year-old Dana had accidentally shot her father while he was asleep. And they did stress that their tests confirmed James could not have fired the shot himself. Yeah. And the investigators actually never bothered to ask Dana whether she'd fired the gun or not or any other questions about the incident. I'm sorry, what? They just felt like the evidence supported that Sharon, what Sharon had told them. There was no evidence to the contrary, and they were ready to rule the death an accident. No one ever said to this two-year-old who they claim walked into a room and was like, Daddy, how does this thing work? Daddy, yeah. and then pulled the trigger, took the safety off and pulled the trigger. No one was like, you know, we should ask this uh, prodigy <laughs> if she actually did that. Like, yeah. we just ask her. You Kids think. will tell you shit. Oh, yeah. Kids will tell you everything. Like, any, I'm sure any preschool or kindergarten teacher knows... They know everything about what happens in your house. Your kid's going to tell them everything. 100%. Like, Have you ever no... seen that meme where it's like, my mommy has two boyfriends. Yeah, it's like literally like, <laughs> and it's like me like, what? what? <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's, why wouldn't you ask that child? Like, did you fire this gun in your dad, in your parents' room? Like, there's a way to ask where you're not like yeah, staring they her, making her feel like she did something. You they know. should have brought some kind of expert in. Yeah, bring a psychiatrist in, like right. a child psychologist that can ask in a proper way. 100%. To get the proper answer, like a real... No, it's shoddy police work. It's also, you couple that with the fact that Sharon called and said he had a heart attack, and it's like, why the fuck wouldn't she have said and an accident happened I here? I couldn't find anything to say that they really ever questioned that. This is so bizarre. It is. What the fuck? Uh, maybe she was having an affair with somebody on the police force. I what the hell is going on? She was on? having lots of affairs. So who knows? Yeah. That's complete speculation, Damn. by the way. But with the autopsy complete and the cause of death listed as accidental officially, Sharon was free to collect on the various wow. life insurance policies that had been taken out in the years before James's death, including wow. from the Veterans Administration, life insurance, and homeowners insurance. And with James dead, the balance on the mortgage for the house was wiped out and transferred to Sharon. She received roughly $29,000, which today would be like receiving $300,000. dollars God. So she cashed yeah. in on this. Now, if it weren't for her reckless impulsivity, Sharon Kenny might have never become a suspect in her husband's death. Uh -oh. But she was arrogant and narcissistic and constantly looking for something or someone to validate her and prop up her self-esteem, which mm. is what led her to Walter Jones. Now, after cashing out on all those insurance policies, she wasted absolutely no time spending the money. And actually, long before James's death, she'd been pestering him to buy her a Ford Thunderbird. She really wanted a Thunderbird. And he refused because he was like, one, we have two children. Like, yeah. that's not necessarily a family car. And uh, two, those are fucking expensive and we don't yeah. have the money. But now, with James out of the way and her pockets flush with cash, Sharon went down to the Rudy Fick Ford dealership on April 18th, 1960. And she was helped by one Walter Jones. Uh oh. Now, Walter was said to be a handsome guy with a big, friendly personality. He had all the charm and persuas persuasiveness necessary to succeed in car sales. I was going to say, car salesman. He is. In fact, at the time, Sharon only intended to get the air conditioner in James's old Nash fixed, but Walter quickly and easily talked her into trading in the old car, her husband, her dead husband's car, for the one that she had dreamed about. Her new car. Yep. And soon she was making regular visits to the dealership, oh. if you catch my if drift. you know what I mean. It's like Globe Motors and the Sopranos. Now- <laughs> It turned out, while Walter may have been a good car salesman, he wasn't really a great person. No? At the time he began his affair with Sharon, he was married. Ugh. Married to his high school sweetheart, Patricia. Everybody chill the fuck out. No, they you're, can't. You're all too much. The most. <laughs> they had gotten, him and Patricia, they had gotten married right out of high school, just before Walter enlisted in the Marines, and they relocated to California. Now, after he was just discharged, they moved back to Missouri, but by then, their marriage was doomed. In fact, Walter's affairs began almost immediately after they married Gross. and continued up until he met Sharon in the spring of 1960. And Patricia, Patricia, excuse me, her choice to stay with her husband was only because of their two children mm -hmm. and her desire to work things out for their sake. And that is, I mean, that's still a thing. I respect it. And it's, and it, like we were saying, like it never works out. It, re it really doesn't. It, I, I haven't seen many things work out in that when that's the motivation. No. But you can also understand people's motivation for thinking that's going Absolutely. to be a good thing. So I, I want to make sure you guys know, like, we know why people do it. 
Yeah. It just, it, we, there's, there's a lot of evidence to prove that it right. doesn't work. And again, of course, there's, ev- there's an exception to every rule. Of course. It could work out. And this was a different time and that was much more the thing back then. Yeah, like, divorce much was more than down it upon. is now. Now it's usually more to do with like morality things and like religious things. Right. But that was like the the norm. Yeah, yeah like back then it wasn't just like religious people. No, that it was were, just like, like, like let's not get divorced. Societal, it was societal, exactly. Mm-hmm. Now Walter's marriage was, uh, of course, always a source of frustration for Sharon. Not because she was in love with him, but because as long as he was married, she wouldn't have total control over him. Exactly. So now, determined to break up the marriage, <laughs> Sharon relied on a strategy, a st- strategy, tragedy. a strategy that had worked for her in the past. And in mid May. She told Walter that she was pregnant with his child and demanded that he end his marriage. She's the worst. She's not pregnant, by the way. Yeah, she's the worst. She is, and she'll only get worse. Fuck Sharon. So the news came as a surprise to Walter, but he was hardly ready to give in to those demands. He was already cheating on his wife and two children. You think he's going to marry you and do the right thing? Exactly. He's like, please. By that time, his infidelity was actually not really that much of a secret to his wife, which had led to several arguments between him and Patricia who by then had threatened to leave him and take the children multiple times. Which, like, go, girl. And faced with the, res- with the possibility of losing his wife and kids, he actually started to reconsider his relationship with Sharon. Mm. She was controlling, manipulative, she could be cruel, and now he'd actually begun to resent how dependent he'd become on her for attention and the money that she occasionally provided wow. with all those life insurance payouts. And to add to all of that, during the week of May 27th, while Sharon had been away on vacation, he spent more time at home like than he ever had while he was dating Sharon and realized how much he actually missed his wife when Sharon, like when she was gone and he actually went to spend time with his wife. What a guy. He was like, wow, I actually miss you. Like, I, wow. I remember why I married you. Romance. Can you fucking imagine? What no. an asshole. So given that, he decided that when Sharon returned in a few days, he would end the relationship and really begin working on repairing his marriage. Okay. But unfortunately, he would never get that chance. Uh Uh-oh. On the evening of May 27th, 1960, John Boldese, I'm sure you remember that name, Sharon's Mm -hmm. high school boyfriend. High school boyfriend. And, you know, side piece, called the Jackson County Sheriff's Department to report that he and his lady had taken a drive out to the Lover's Lane area just off of Phelps Road, a little outside of Independence, and they'd made a horrible discovery. At first, Boldese told investigators the couple had thought the woman who was illuminated by their headlights had just fallen asleep in the wooded area, but after getting out to investigate, they had found four bullet holes in her head, stomach, and both shoulders. Oh my god. He was calling to report that he had found a body. Now, when investigators arrived on the scene, they found very little evidence to work with. The woman, who would later be identified as Walter's wife, Patricia Jones... What the fuck? ...had been shot four times, and at least one of those shots had been fired close enough to leave powder burns on her skirt. Oh my god. Now, there was a surprising lack of blood at the scene, which led investigators to strongly consider whether she'd been shot elsewhere and dumped in the woods. And her clothes seemed to be disarranged but they hadn't been removed okay and there wasn't any other evidence of a sexual assault she had not been sexually assaulted it appeared to investigators that patricia had been killed elsewhere and dumped in the woods and the scene had been staged yeah but as far as a motive they were lost now the next morning walter was brought into the sheriff's office sheriff's office for questioning and he explained that he hadn't seen his wife the previous morning And actually, he had filed a missing persons report when she failed to return home the night before. He even offered to take a polygraph test to prove his innocence. Damn. Now, the case took a surprising turn when investigators learned that Boldiz's girlfriend was none other than Sharon Kinney. Holy shit. The woman whose husband was killed just two months earlier. What the fuck? Sharon's explanation for the death of her husband seemed a bit suspicious at the time. Yeah, it did. But without any evidence to suggest anything otherwise, investigators had no choice but to accept her statement. But now, her proximity to two murders in a two-month span raised those earlier suspicions a bit higher. And to add to those suspicions, in his statement to the sheriff, Walter admitted he'd been having an affair with one Sharon Kinney for a little more than a month and also mentioned that one of his wife's friends had seen Patricia and Sharon together the day before Sharon, uh, excuse me, the day before Patricia went missing. What the fuck? She was spotted with Sharon. 
And Sharon? Not by just like a, a random eyewitness, by one of Patricia's friends. Sinister. This sinister. woman is sinister as fuck. Truly. So according to Walter's statement, he and Patricia had actually argued on the morning of Thursday, May 26th. And then they went their separate ways. She went to her job. She worked at the IRS. And he went to drop the children off with the babysitter before heading to work himself. And when he got home later that evening, he expected to find her, but she was nowhere to be found. So he starts calling all her friends and coworkers, one of which was the woman who said she had seen Patricia and Sharon together. And then another friend told Walter that she'd asked to be dropped off at an unusual location where, quote, they had seen Mrs. Jones enter a 1957 or 1958 Dodge driven by a young woman. Huh. So upon hearing this, Walter said he called Sharon, who said that she had indeed spoken to Patricia that afternoon and told her that Walter was having an affair with her sister. So it, that's a little bit confusing. So <laughs> Sharon fuck? contacts Patricia and says, I know your husband. He's having an affair with, with my, my sister. sister. And I want to tell you about it because I think you deserve to know. Sharon and that's how she gets sucks. her into a car with her. Sharon sucks. Big time. Now, Walter's statement and polygraph, 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 (laughs) my grandma, (laughs) that's an insider, Uh, this polygraph examination didn't rule him out entirely, but it did go a long way toward removing him from the suspect list. Yeah. Sharon, on the other hand, did little to get herself off of that suspect list and pretty much everything to get herself onto it. Yeah, that's not shocking. Walter had agreed to that polygraph exam and he actually signed a written statement to his whereabouts. Sharon made a verbal statement, but she refused to sign anything and refused to take a polygraph examination. In her verbal statement, she claimed she had only gone, quote, on about 12 dates with Walter, which, like, that's a lot. He's still married with kids, my friend. And, like, your relationship has only been going on for dates? two months. Yeah, like, so, like that's, that's a lot of dates. Standard. <laughs> she said that she called Patricia Jones and met with her that Thursday afternoon to break off the relationship with Walter. But it's like, no, you didn't. No, you, you didn't. said that he's having an affair with your sister. <laughs> like, what the hell? You were setting her up. Yeah, exactly. The officer who took her statement recalled Sharon saying, I'm very fond of Walt and I didn't want anything to happen to him and his family. So she said she called Patricia and told her there was something she needed to tell her about her husband, but that she needed to do it in person. So you're fond of Walt. You don't want anything to happen to him or his family, but you're going to tell his wife that you guys have been having an affair. You're going to blow up his entire family yeah. by like, saying that you, uh, your sister and him have been yeah. having an affair. Now, Sharon's story was that she had borrowed her father's car that afternoon. Ah, so that Dodge, Walt, perhaps? Mm-hmm, so that Walt wouldn't recognize her car when she dropped his wife off at home and that she picked up Patricia at the location where she was last seen by her coworker. So that was Sharon. Like, honey, you did it. You're admitting it already. Like, it, you're not getting out of this, I hope. Please tell me. Once they were in Sharon's <laughs> car, she told Patricia that Walter had been having an affair with her sister and she wanted her to know because she felt it was inappropriate and needed to come to an end. Shut the fuck up, Sharon. <laughs> Shut up, Sharon. Now, after they'd spoken, Sharon said, you know, it was awful. I can't believe I had to tell her that. Yeah. And then I dropped her about a block away from the Jones house, which why would you drop her off a block away? If You're in you a car that your... he doesn't recognize. That's the whole reason you had that car. Exactly. <laughs> but she idiot. said she then looked in the rearview mirror and, quote, saw Mrs. Jones <laughs> talking to a man in a two-tone green 1957 Ford. So she... <laughs> So she got out of the car and immediately this other guy's like, whoop, whoop. Here I am. Yeah. Beep, oh, absolutely. Beep. That makes total sense. Yeah. According to Sharon, it came as a total shock to yeah. coincidentally happen upon Patricia's body where she and Bodies were out at the lover's lane that evening. Yeah. Isn't that wild that you talked to the wife of the man that you've been having an affair with that day? You dropped her off and then, oh my God, you just stumbled upon her dead body later that day? You happen what to be the one who discovers it? Whoa. Buy a lottery ticket, Sharon. Buy several. Wow. Now, as far as she knew, she said that Patricia was, quote, upset but not mad after she informed her of the affair. So she couldn't imagine what could have happened to lead to her yeah. death. No, of course you can't because nothing else happened. You no. killed her. So no way. There's that. Now, the, Also, you went to a lover's lane with your boyfriend. She's grow in her, the fuck up. She's in her early 20s still. But, like, grow the fuck up. Honestly. <laughs> well, you have two children. What yeah, are you like, doing? Shut the fuck up. It's wild. We went to a lover's lane. Dave, like, shut the fuck up. Dave makes, like, little notes sometimes, and he was like, I know it may seem weird that they're in a lover's lane, but please remember that she is in her early 20s. <laughs> so, like, because it's also just this. crazy to be like, she is in her early 20s, yeah. and all of this and has all happened of this in has her happened. life. <laughs> yes. In your head, you're like, Jesus Christ, you're 35. What are you doing in a lover's <laughs> like, lane? Like, like, grow up. 
<laughs> but she's she's young still. She's now, done a lot. Yeah. The autopsy determined that Patricia's cause of death was the gunshot wound in her head. And they placed the time of death around 8 or 9 p.m. on May 27th, just a few hours before the body was discovered. But unfortunately, the three bullets that they retrieved from the shoulders and the head were so badly damaged that they couldn't be used for a match to the weapon. And the fourth bullet had entered Patricia's stomach and exited out of her back and then presumably got lodged somewhere where she'd been killed. Hmm. So with no other leads, detectives went back to the woods where the body was discovered and started searching with metal detectors, hoping to find that fourth bullet. Now, a team of investigators spent all day searching the woods for that, fo- that fourth bullet that passed through Patricia's stomach, but they had no luck finding it or any other additional evidence. Yeah, because I don't think it happened out there. It gets a little hairy. Okay. And, and you'll see where in part two. But in the meantime, Walter and John Baldice were both brought in for additional questioning, and they both were given a polygraph examination, which they passed. Hmm. It was then that Walter admitted when he learned that Sharon had been with his wife the night she went missing... He did not call her like he had said originally. He actually went to her house and confronted her in person. Oh, damn, Walter. Yeah, it gets worse. According to Walter, when Patricia's friend said that she saw her with Sharon, he went to Sharon and after putting a knife to her throat, demanded that she help search for his wife. These poor children I know. involved in this kind of shit. You just hope that they weren't around God, like, for seeing weren't. any of this. Like, Jesus. hopefully they were with her. The babysitter that's raising them. Exactly. And uh, James Kinney's parents were still very mm. involved in their lives. But within an hour of that incident, Sharon and Boldies discovered Patricia's body in the woods. How convenient. I love that Walter shows up, puts a knife to your throat, tells you to go, You like, you better find my wife. And you're like, cool. He leaves and you're like, hey, John, you want to go to a lover's lane and just hang out? And John's like, yeah, sure, sure. And he's like, absolutely. And then you you just stumble upon You're like, wow, good luck for me, fortunately. And it's like, clearly she led you to a certain area in this. Clearly clearly she killed Patricia. Like, we all know that. We all know that. So she clearly led you to the location where she knew your headlights were going to. Of course. Like, illuminate Patricia. (gasps) Oh, my God. That way she could, like, uh, rid herself of the issue of Walter being, like, find my wife. Right. And also be like, oh, she's gone. That's That's crazy. Yeah. I saw her get into a car with some random ass man. Wow. Now, the good thing investigation wise was that each new revelation seemed to lead to some other piece of critical information about the case. Because when Boldiz was asked about Walter's story, he admitted that he and Sharon had indeed gone out to the woods, not for intimacy, but to look for Patricia. I was going to say. Yeah. So that's how that explains that. And that wasn't all he told investigators. According to him, a couple weeks before Patricia's murder, Sharon had, quote, talked him into going to the sheriff's office to try to get James Kinney's pistol back. But obviously they refused that request. What the fuck? But it's like, okay, is that the same police department, like, investigating this death? Because would you not have that on note that some random man was like, I need James Kinney's pistol back? Are the police okay here? No. The answer is no. No. The answer is not well, bitch. They are not well, bitch. Because, like, what you're not even asking... The, the fact that they didn't even talk to that two-year-old to be like, hey, Wild. let's see what she says about whether she shot her dad or not. Yep. Like, just give it a shot. hmm Not doing that. Mm-mm. And then, like, this, they're like, oh, yeah. How crazy. We don't, we don't have that on file. It's How like, wild. what the fuck? Like, this lady's obviously got a lot of shit going on around her. Maybe, like, keep an eye when she asks for a pistol back. You would think. That was involved in a murder. Or that, or when like, her, like, lover comes in yeah. and asks for it. Like, come on. It's like, maybe make note of that. Oy. But while the detectives continued questioning Walter and Valdez, a team of investigators switched their attention from the wooded area where Patricia's body was located to an abandoned farm building across the street. And on the morning of May 30th, investigators searching the barn found two blanks with bullet holes and powder burns, leading them to suspect that Patricia may have been taken to the barn and killed before (gasps) being dumped in the woods. Oh, that's fucked up. And they believed that could account for the chunk of time where she was missing between when she was last seen by coworkers and when she was discovered in the woods. Ah. That was a theory. Now, the search of the barn didn't give much in terms of new evidence, but as investigators were starting to feel like they were losing momentum, a co-worker of Sharon's from the photo processing plant that she was currently working at came forward to police with what he thought was vital evidence. According to this co-worker, a few weeks before Patricia's body was discovered, 
Sharon had pressured him into buying a high standard 22 caliber pistol for her. How does she convince people to do these things? She has a way with She's men. She's manipulative. She's man. got a way with yeah. men. Some women just do. Now, when detectives confronted her with this information, Sharon, quote, explained she wanted the weapon for protection on her trip to Washington that she'd taken with Boldies just days before the murder and claimed she left the gun with family in Washington. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Now, All right. although their physical <laughs> evidence was weak, the circumstantial evidence against Sharon Kinney at this point was substantial. She'd been having an affair with the victim's husband. She was the last person to be seen with Patricia Jones. She was the one to find the body in an out-of-the-way location. Yeah, she had to go and find it. She had gone out of her way to obtain a gun and then lost said gun. Yeah. She was refusing to make any sworn statement or submit I mean, a polygraph on. exam. And on top of that, her husband had died under similarly mysterious circumstances just two months earlier, after which she collected on insurance policies that not only gave her a clear title to the house, but also solved any financial problems. It may not have been a slam dunk case, but she definitely looked guilty. This is wild. And it's also so weird that we chose cases this week that had to do with insurance payouts right in the nick of time before financial ruin. That is weird. Like, that's the exact thing with the OC yeah, case. That yeah. is very strange. Very weird. But on the evening of May 31st, just hours after Patricia Jones's funeral... Deputies from the Jackson County Sheriff's Department served a warrant at Sharon's yes. home. And she was taken into custody and charged with the murder of Patricia Jones. Good. Get her. And that's where we're going to wrap for part one. Yeah. I'm so sorry. But in part two, there is a lot to cover. Like I said, part two is going to be a little bit trial heavy and you'll see why. But once we get through the trial part of it, which like if you're like me and that's not necessary, not necessarily your thing, we're going to get through it together. And it's going to be worth it because then we go into a whole slew of other wild shit. Damn, I don't know how this can get more wild, but here I am. You know what? I was saying the same thing as I was writing this. And then I was just like, it got more wild. It got more wild. It got crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So we hope you keep listening. And we hope you keep it weird. weird. But it's so weird that you try to stage your husband's murder like your two-year-old did it because that's just really that's fucked so up and weird. That's so fucked up. That's so wild. I can't get over that. Just wait. Blaming it on her two-year-old. Just wait. It's wild.